Um, thank you everyone for being here and uh, thank you uh, Yanis and Helene and Doros for organizing things and, uh, and to Neem for, for hosting me here. Um, so I'm Rosemary Lee and um, my presentation today will be a structural plan for imitation, engines of differentiation. And it's part of an EMAP residency with the European Media Art Platform. And so in that context, Yannick and Helene are hosting me at NIME. And, uh, and it's also, uh, I should uh, give credit as well to Creative Europe for, for supporting the project um, and, and EMAP in general. Um, so with all the, all the thank yous kind of out of the way, um, we can kind of get into things. Um, so before I kind of get into the project that I've been develop developing here over the past month and a half so far in, in collaboration with Alexia, um, I'll kind of try to give a little bit of background for myself and my work and the projects that I've been uh, working on that have, have kind of led up to and very much inform this current project. Um, so the past few years, I, I guess since 2017 or so, I've been really looking into the influence of machine learning and artificial intelligence on visual culture. And I've been doing this through art and practice-led research, um, practice-led theoretical research, I should say. Um, and I guess maybe it's, it's Somewhat relevant also to say that, like, so my, my educational background has been quite diverse. Um, I started out in uh, doing a BFA at, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I was, uh, I started with oil painting and uh, like sculpture in like wood and stone, and, uh, and I uh, subsequently went very theoretical and I, I got a master's degree in media studies uh, from the European Graduate School and then my PhD was in a very technical context at the IT University in Copenhagen um, where I was uh, very much looking into uh, AI and art. Uh, that was the topic of my PhD. So I guess all of these things kind of converge. It's always uh, art, theory and technology uh, in various, various combinations. Um, so I, I have to, of course, plug my new book because I uh, just published it very recently. Um, the title is Algorithm Image Art, and it gives a historical perspective on recent developments in uh, intersections between machine learning, art, and then a kind of deeper history of using um, computational processes and um, very defined sets of rules and instructions uh, to inform visual, visual media. Um, so just to kind of uh, maybe give an overview of what the book covers. Um, so it starts by introducing and defining what, what I actually mean by algorithmic image production. And then it proceeds at that topic from mm, several different angles. Um, so, I, I guess part of the inspiration for the project in general was actually looking at how um, geometric approximation has, has been used even since ancient times uh, to embed algorithmic relationships um, into visual, visual compositions. Um, and a big part of that is actually the transcription of visual information in textual and alphanumeric form. Um, and as you can kind of, well, everybody here kind of is uh, quite techie, techie literate. So, so um, that uh, transcription uh, of, of algorithmic instructions then really paves the way for automation. Um, and then kind of moving forward towards this, um, I, something that I've been really fascinated about is um, uh, how all of this kind of comes together in an alignment between the human and the machine point of view. 
and I would not be able to even uh, like address that topic without Harun Faroqi's operational image, which is a very central uh, theory in that, that area. Um, and then kind of wrapping up the book, I, I get into refraction, which I address in terms of um, the construction of composite images or, or what I call kind of composite strategies uh, of, of image making. So with many images or a lot of image data becoming amassed into single singular images, um, which we can see in, there are earlier precursors, but we, of course, the very familiar uh, example that we, we are um, witnessing very often now is in machine learning, uh, like image generators. Um, and then the final, final uh, chapter of the book uh, closes with uh, looking at distortion and looking at, at uh, bias um, and situations of error that, that can come from these uh, systems. Um, so just to kind of quote myself, um, I have a short uh, excerpt from the book. Um, so I say, while machine learning may have the potential to introduce new modalities into image production, it often repli replicates, emulates, or expands upon tendencies already present in older paradigms of image making. Machine learning has proven to have wide ranging, intricate, and sometimes unpredictable ramifications, such as its inclination towards not only the reiteration, but even amplification of embedded biases and ambiguities in, in the visual and non-visual aspects of images. Um, so these themes are very much present and, and um, developed in different ways in the current project that, that I've been working on here. And they make up part of the core arguments of my PhD thesis, uh, which, which uh, led up to the book. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm kind of always obligated to say that I'm coming from a background in media archaeology um, because that so much informs my perspective. Um, and media archaeology is both a field and a, a discipline that seeks to understand current technologies and media artifacts through relationships with those of the past. Um, so I, I would say that digging and excavation um, are major modalities in, in all the work that I do, uh, both art artistically and uh, in my research. Um, and yeah, so in this looking, looking into insights uh, or looking for insights into emerging technologies through, through technologies of the past, um, media archaeology often takes inspiration or um, uh, makes reference to precursor technologies. Um, and so coming from that background, I, it's, it's always kind of very much part of my point of view that it's, it's very problematic not to consider the historical context that, that our technologies uh, emerge from or, or that they've been informed by. Um, and so with that kind of in mind, also this, the, the excavation um, part of, of media archeology, span um, I'm finding, and maybe reflecting more and more on this, uh, but so visual material um, from technical as well as archival sources, um, just as much as from cultural sources is very much a part of my work. And, and so kind of, sourcing, like digging through archives and digging through databases is very much um, something that, that I've been uh, working with in the past um, few years. Um, so that kind of leads me into one project that I, that I developed during my PhD, which is presented in the exhibition here. Um, it's titled Deconstructing Representation. And um, it very much tries to kind of dig into how could we as humans start to better understand what, what representations in a machine learning sense are. 
um, because they're ultimately there are these statistical relationships that are not human intelligible, but then we can they can be formulated then in ways that we have access to, like in, in, if we generate an image, then we can kind of develop an understanding of what might be going on in, in, in the system, uh, or a model, or the, the data set that it, uh, a model is uh, trained on. Um, and um, yeah, so that's something that I was very much trying to kind of work with in, in this project. And um, I guess the main points of inspiration for the project were uh, Abby Warburg's Nemocyan Atlas, which is a really kind of fascinating project where he developed this somewhat, um, uh, yeah, I would say quite unconventional method for uh, visual analysis in art history that it did not become widely adopted or, and I guess, was not, not necessarily very uh, recognized maybe at the time. Um, but in, in a sense, it's starting to be recognized as significant to the history, uh, the cultural history relative to machine learning because he was making these panels um, that's on the right is, is one of the panels from, from his Nemosign Atlas. And so what he, how he refers to it is um, attempting to map the afterlife of antiquity. Um, and so what he was doing is composing these, covering these wooden panels in fabric and then composing art historical examples on these panels in order to um, make a kind of gestalt uh, analysis from, from multiple images at once. And as you can see in the image, of course, they're like quite small, um, but he, he tries to make these kind of visual relationships between diverse uh, images. So sometimes it's from very different contexts that he's, he's um, juxtaposing images together and then trying to understand how various influences translate across time um, and culture or also how like certain themes get repeated again and again. Um, so he makes these like correlations between different shapes or, or allegorical themes. Um, so in another, so at, at the same time I also was doing like trying to kind of make a correlation between what is going on in again, for example, so a generative and adversarial network um, and kind of taking all of these images uh, and then making sense of them. And then maybe also like the kind of processes that, that creative workers use when, when implementing a mood board. So either in design or, or in art contexts. Um, this, and and these, this is maybe kind of recalling what I brought up about my book. Um, this kind of strategy is what I refer to as like composite images. Um, this this many to one uh, kind of image relationships. Um, so yeah, so I kind of think of the work as like documenting the process of training this uh, this scan um, and trying to kind of look at how patterns from the training data and how the structures of the system actually shape the outcome and. Um, Okay, the, the images are maybe too small in this, uh, in this slide for you to, to really see it, but um, there, I noticed some similarities in, in the kinds of images that were, that were developed through the system that I was using. And there's obviously these tendencies towards like particular kinds of compositions, um, <coughs> color combinations, also a tendency towards um, like black dots on a white ground, reminiscent of, of like faces, um, or landscapes, there's a lot of landscape uh, reminiscent images that emerge from that. Um, so ultimately I, I ended up composing um, a kind of documentation of all the data that I was working with as, as then a print. Um, and so this is uh, it as it is installed in Neem uh, currently. 
Um, but kind of going, going on to um, a structural plan for imitation, um, so something I think about a lot is how do we make sense of the just massive amount of visual data that gets processed daily um, and that we that we're, it's kind of thrown at us and, and, um, or is extracted from us in, in one way or another. Um, and then I, maybe secondary to that also, um, or, or part of that is um, trying to think about how we address the impact of AI on, on visual culture. Um, so I, I'm finding often there's, there's quite like polarized uh, opinions in, in discourses on AI um, and very, very diverse proposals for how we might proceed. Um, and especially as, as artists uh, or, or researchers working with, with this area. Um, and Matteo Pasquinelli has some, some interesting insights on this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to quote from his recent book, The Eye of the Master, where he says, um, the idea of the automatic computer in the contemporary sense emerged out of the project to me mechanize the mental labor of clerks rather than the old alchemic dream uh, of building thinking automata. Although the latter narrative would often be used in the 19th century, much as in the century of corporate AI, to masquerade the former business. So this kind of discrepancy between um, the, how those in positions of power developing and de deploying these technologies portray their intentions to the pu public um, is very different uh, from you know, the reality of what's going on and, and maybe um, yeah, the actual perceptions of those who are subjected to these technologies. Um, so Alba Noe also offers some insight saying, models are ways of exploring the world or accomplishing certain goals. We use the model to pose and answer questions. And a model is useful, successful, and accurate just insofar as it achieves a purpose. Um, so I think it's really important when we, when we think about this, um, this perspective on, on models is that they, it highlights how the way that models function is deeply ideal, ideological and, and like very far from, from neutral. Um, so some of this, um, yeah, all of this kind of contributes to this idea that I've kind of been developing of, of AI as, as maybe machines of differentiation um, that are not incidentally divisive, you know, in terms of the discourses surrounding it, but also in terms of the experiences that different demographics have with, with AI uh, powered technologies. Um, but yeah, so these are not incidentally divisive, but intentionally so. Um, and yeah, so of course in this work, I, I look to critical perspectives on AI, such as those proposed by Joy and Weenie uh, in her Gender Shades project. Um, and what's really radical about that project, I, I find is that she developed this uh, methodology to prove uh, and document the bias in facial recognition systems. Um, and I, I, that aspect is, of course, where I, I uh, very much connected with Alexia's work, um, where she is working on developing new, new methodologies for looking at and also working with AI and what is visualized through AI. Um, so part of that work involves addressing the fact that AI looks far less than like this uh, than it does like this uh, or this um, or, you know, these many layers of, of representation kind of behind, behind AI. Um, and, and so I, I recently heard a proposal of, of thinking of AI as like digital kitsch. Um, and as innocuous as they are, um, these images, like these generated images, and it's important to note, these are generated training data. So they're generated to then generate more images. 
And there are some like really, really horrific uh, like atrocities of visual culture going on in these uh, training databases. Um, but they're also a part of larger, like very problematic tendencies that we don't have time for. Um, so a, a theory that I really, really like for trying to understand uh, these training data sets is Hito Styrel's poor <coughs> image, um, which she says, the poor image is a copy in motion. Its quality is bad, its re resolution substandard. As it accelerates, it deteriorates. It's a ghost of an image, a preview, a thumbnail, an errant idea, an itinerant image described for free, squeezed through slow digital connections, compressed, reproduced, ripped, remixed, as well as copied and pasted into other channels of distribution. Um, so what I find really interesting and compelling about this idea is her kind of trying to argue for valuing and, and looking closely at these throwaway images that, you know, um, some of the examples that she gives in the original essay that she, she wrote uh, that this comes from um, are kind of hilarious, but then when you kind of move behind the humor, you realize like we don't, we're not paying enough attention actually to the minutia of this data. Um, so what I would kind of argue is at stake in that perspective is that we are really moving away from the mirror paradigm of the image and um, this older idea of the image as an accurate reflection of the world. Um, and due to the nature of AI, uh, we can no longer uh, consider that a tenable perspective on, on images. Um, so we have this wealth of visual data and we can't really make sense of it um, and it, it entails all these embedded problems and biases and power dynamics. Um, so I guess that kind of brings me to, to this quote that has been very much with me through, throughout the development of this project um, and it's from Raoul Vanagem. Um, there is no weapon of your individual will, which once appropriated by others, does not turn against you. Um, and so that's, that's a theme that Alexia and I have been really kind of discussing quite a lot in, um, in our work together and, and related to AI, like how do we deal with this, this aspect of, uh, of technology to kind of always cut against us and, and even cut against itself. Um, and I think there are positives and negatives to, to that. I think I might need to actually hand over to Alexia. Um, with that. Thank you. Uh, does this move a little bit? Cool. So hi everyone, I'm Alexia. I'm an artist and a PhD student based here in Cyprus. Um, my focus is AI from a decolonial, post-colonial, intersectional feminist perspective. Um, and I specifically am interested in looking at AI and our position here in places such as Cyprus, like semi-peripheries in the global AI ecosystem um, and ex-colony, what that means um, and what the, what the impact of, you know, all of this, all these power dynamics, global power dynamics are. Um, and uh, lately I've been really interested in how to create work that also functions outside galleries and conferences where I can engage with the local community. Um, and one such example is the AI colonialism board game, which is currently at the AI and art exhibition at NIEM. Um, that game has been inspired by Mary Flanagan's critical play method um, where she argues that critical artist games, I have a quote, but 
I'm getting old and I can't see this. Uh, she says that um, critical artist games can function as means for creative expression, as instruments for conceptual thinking, or as tools to help examine or work through social issues. So in this game, um, players have to collectively fight against AI colonialism while avoiding having their data scraped by the web scraper and try to speculate what a fair, just separate AI system could look like. And the game aims to prompt reflection from the point of view of an AI periphery of what AI colonialism might mean on a very local, Cypriot uh, way, and what, how it might impact the local communities here in Cyprus, because not everyone will be impacted the same way. And so when uh, Rosemary asked me to collaborate on this project, that was really cool. Thank you, Rosemary. <laughs> uh, it was great because we both uh, are looking into these links of history and how uh, embedded uh, current technology is to the past. So it doesn't really exist in a vacuum. And Rosemary proposed that I contribute from like colonial, decolonial, anti-colonial perspective. Um, so I thought I could talk about that. And I'll start by elaborating a little bit of what I mean by all these terms. So when we look at narratives of Silicon Valley CEOs, how they promote and how they sell the, the technology, uh, they have all these very universal promises of AI benefiting all of humanity, everyone, everywhere, um, that like we're going to have AI systems that will lead to us not having to work and it's going to be the best world ever. But the question is, best world, but according to whom? Um, power in AI is not equally distributed uh, globally. Um, by power, I mean who, who gets to develop these technologies, who has a say in them, who benefits, but who is left out as well. And because it is such an expensive technology, it requires a lot of money, a lot of data, a lot of very specialized skill sets. Um, we have this huge differences of who can afford to develop these technologies. And we have countries such as the USA and China who lead in terms of power in AI globally, but then we also have smaller countries such as Cyprus who we don't have a say and we're dependent on technologies created by these big AI superpowers. And as a result, we have this centralization of power in AI, uh, which is mostly centralized to the very small number of American private companies. And so we have these very few AI superpowers who, through their processes, repeat this new form of colonialism, but this time it's colonialism through corporate means. Um, they've adopted neocolonial processes, but they also have revived these colonial era methodologies and theories that many of them are not uh, scientific and imposed on the rest of the world. So because of this dominance that Silicon Valley has on AI, the, their technologies are obviously trained to see the world through this very Western worldview, Western gaze, which is imposed on the rest of us. And we have these historical colonial worldviews that are embedded in the technology today. And as an example, um, you know, Silicon Valley's representation of who a terrorist is or what a terrorist looks like, it perpetuates these historical patterns of Western colonial era racism and imperialism in this region. So for example, we have here a uh, historic photo of uh, Palestinians being searched for arms during uh, an uprising uh, in 1936. And we have juxtaposed this image of generated, AI generated image of what uh, a terrorist looks like. 
or um, also the, the technologies that are being prioritized by Western powers. They follow these colonial era necropolitics. Uh, we have very racialized, militarized politics on migration and asylum in the EU. And that's translated into what kinds of AI technologies are being funded by those in power. And all of this despite the fact that the West's colonial activities in the past, but also in present day, are linked to these conflicts and economical hardship that lead uh, these regions, uh, these people to flee from these regions. Um, so for developing uh, our, uh, this project, we faced a, few, well, faced a few challenges of how to depict this appropriation of AI towards justice and empowerment in a visual way. Um, from a decolonial and a feminist approach to these topics is very it's highly situated. It's very local and context specific and usually very narrow. But because in this collaboration, we're not dealing with a specific issue in AI that we're trying to decolonize, but we're talking about a more general critique of the system. Um, it, it was a bit of a challenge of how to depict this visually for the video part of the artwork. So um, how to talk about colonial resistance of AI in general terms. And also it was very important to consider the ethics of intellectual property when you know, visualizing all this of, uh, of the imagery and how to avoid perpetuating this uh, data practices that we critique as well. Um, so I focused on using imagery from the public domain and this is still kind of work in progress but um, considered using historical photography as of anti-colonial resistance to draw these historical parallels uh, or metaphors with what's happening today. So for example, I went for historic imagery of uh, sabotage of colonial technology. It's a form of resistance. So that's, this is an image of uh, the Palestinian uprising again during British colonial rule or appropriating colonial technology um, with local means and local context as a form of passive resistance against colonial rule. Um, and how all of that could be juxtaposed with practices of resistance in the present day. So recent examples include the Hollywood writer's strike where writers demanded guardrails against the use of generative AI in filmmaking or protests by Kenyan workers who have worked in really horrible and traumatizing and exploitative conditions, labeling graphic content to help build ChatGPT. So perhaps as historical mass action protests, boycott, divestment contributed to this fall of colonial powers. So perhaps by making these um, juxtapositions contrast, perhaps mass organizing could also contribute to that today. So yeah, that's uh, my bit, thank you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you brought up some really great points about how some of our discussion has really been about, yeah, okay, we have these grand ideas, but how do we actually do it? And how do we actually how do we communicate these things and how do we deal with these larger systemic questions? Um, and that, that has been kind of like a, a really big um, part of the work. I'm just going to backtrack to a, probably my stupidest slide, but it, it serves a purpose. Um, because going back to that uh, Van Ajem, uh, Van Ajem uh, quote, uh, where he, he says that you know the, the um, intentions of using a tool can actually then uh, always turn against you. Um, I guess you know a, a flip of that or just a variation of that is that 
just using technology the wrong way is not going to necessarily subvert it and like it's not necessarily going to provide you with a solution. Um, so that's something that I've very much been thinking about was like just because we want these uh, more progressive approaches to AI and, and we have the intention to build kind of build better um, tools or to use them better or to come up with some kind of answer. Um, it's, it's not straightforward where, where that will actually take us. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of maybe spend the last five minutes um, focusing on the actual work. And um, I guess I should also say that it's still kind of a work in progress even though we're presenting it to the public today. Um, we had this opportunity to, to incorporate it in the show, so we, we jumped at that. Um, and um, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, the, one of the ideas that we, or one of the ideas that I was really kind of thinking a lot about uh, regarding these topics is how diffraction and refraction could be used as metaphors for what's going on in an AI system. So kind of also related to the deconstructing representation, I, I'm kind of interested in understandable AI, um, also from a research, research uh, standpoint. Um, so these are just a few ske sketches that I made of, uh, you know, kind of looking at uh, the process of trying to think, of, think about this convergence of different perspectives um, and the development of new relationships with the visual that we, that we find in, in AI. Um, I ended up getting really kind of inspired by these optical benches that are used for scientific experiments with, uh, with light. Um, and I, I found it kind of interesting how this, it, it's like a, an experimental tool, but that could be, can be used to distort um, our visual perception. Um, and that kind of ended up converging with, with getting really fascinated with Fresnel lenses. Um, so I started out just by kind of digging into the, the past like year or so. I've been downloading as many machine learning um, training data sets as I can and kind of playing with those images and trying to figure out like how can I work with these images in some way. Um, so I kind of just started out with that, like, let's just bring these two interests together, like experimental optics and what's going on with training data. Um, and so this is just kind of showing a little bit of the, the evolution of my little technical tests, um, where we're starting to get some funky, like, optical aberrations going on. Um, and I guess that also kind of brings me to some thinking I've also been doing about this that um, like Joanna Zelinska has said um, that even uh, vision itself is in essence non-visual because it's ultimately translated into non-visual forms. Um, and I'm, and there, similar statements have also been made about, about AI images that they're non-optical um, and kind of divorced from our, our like human, like fleshy perception. Um, so I was kind of just interested in, in like that juxtaposition of like data, um, you know, digital processes, machine learning, and then optics, which are kind of like, in a way they're, they're moving apart in the world, but, but I kind of wanted to bring them back together. Um, so this is, just a little bit of a behind the scenes preview of one, one early test of, of like the machine setup that I've made. Um, so it has kind of turned into this very sculptural installation of these two interpretations of optical benches and with in integrated projectors that are um, it's effect effectively like a two-channel video installation. Um, and then there are these, uh, some motors adjusting Fresnel lenses and kind of distorting um, uh, 
another, like one of the channels of the video that is mostly composed of training data, but also, um, yeah, some, some kind of collages that, that we've composed using uh, different programs, like a program that I've written, um, and then also working from archival, archival images that Alexia has provided. Um, so ultimately, that's kind of where we stand, um, and, and I don't want to give too much away necessarily, I guess, because hopefully you're all coming to the, the opening tonight, the opening reception. Um, but yeah, but maybe I will close there because uh, I feel like that kind of covers mm. everything, and maybe we open for if there are any questions. So thank you very much.